um, presentation. We have Unclear Ballot, Automated Ballot Image Manipulation uh, with Carl Candula. Please, is that correct? Cart. Uh, Cart, oh sorry, Cart Candula, graduate student of University of Michigan. Uh, Cart Candula received his BSc degree in Computer Science Engineering from the University of Michigan in 2019 and is currently pursuing an MSc in the same area. He's co he conducts research in the UM Security Lab under the supervision of Professor J. Alex Halderman. Currently, his research interest lies in problems affecting society and public policy, specifically election security. He has held internships at Microsoft and J.P. Morgan in the past. And also Jeremy Wink, undergraduate student, University of Michigan. Jeremy Wink is an undergraduate student at the University of Michigan, currently pursuing a BSc in computer science. He has taken multiple security courses and spent time researching, uh, researching topics surrounding election cybersecurity, also under J. Alex Halderman. Thank you so much. So Jeremy's going to get us started. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Jeremy Wink. And my name's Carr Kandula. We're undergraduates from the University of Michigan, and we're presenting Unclear Ballot, which is an attack based on automated ballot image manipulation, which we developed jointly with Matt Bernard and Professor Alex Holliman from the University of Michigan. So to first give some background on our attack, post-election audits are one of the most important factors in guaranteeing the integrity of election results. If an attacker is somehow able to breach an election system in order to manipulate the outcome of the election, post-election audits should serve as a strong layer of defense in order to allow us to detect these breaches. There are several types of post-election audits, including risk-limiting audits, in which a small random sample of paper ballots are inspected in order to give us statistically significant results. Another type of post-election audit is an image audit. In this case, an audit is conducted not on physical paper ballots, but instead on images of the, of the ballots which are taken when the ballots are originally scanned. Uh, this tends to be quicker and a lot more convenient than actually looking through the paper ballots. So this type of audit has been gaining a lot of popularity in recent years and was actually used by the state of Maryland following the 2016 presidential election. This is pretty scary because it turns out this type of audit actually does not hold up under adversarial conditions. If an attacker is able to breach an election system in order to manipulate the results of an election, they could just as easily get access to these digital images of the ballots. If they were then able to manipulate these ballot images in order to change the apparent votes within them, then image audits would offer zero security whatsoever and would effectively be useless. To demonstrate this vulnerability, we've developed an attack which focuses on automatically altering ballot images to change the votes within them. This attack targets tabulation machines which have been shown in the past to not be the most secure devices. And in fact, numerous vulnerabilities have been documented in the past demonstrating how an attacker could potentially infiltrate these voting machines. The strategy of our attack is simple alter the votes within a ballot image in a way that is both undetectable and also consistent with the voter's original markings. In order to do this, we leveraged a variety of computer vision techniques operating under the assumption that the attacker knows what the ballot looks like in advance. This is a pretty reasonable assumption to make, considering many jurisdictions publish sample ballots well ahead of the actual elections. The first step in our attack is to extract bounding boxes around the individual races within the ballot. This can be done by using a template match with a blank copy of the original ballot. The next step in the attack is to extract bounding boxes around the individual names and vote bubbles of each candidate. This is typically done with the Huff line transform, which you can picture here in the slides. For some ballot styles, the title of the race needs to be separated from the top candidate's name in order to prevent the title of the race from interfering with the rest of the attack. This can be done by running a vertical sweep on the image and using pixel intensities to find an area of white space above the candidate's name. It's also worth noting here that the exact algorithm used in this attack varies slightly from ballot style to ballot style, but these same techniques are used pretty consistently across the board. The final step in the attack is to extract bounding boxes around the actual vote bubbles corresponding to each candidate. This is done by using a series of linear sweeps across the image 
once again using pixel intensities to determine the boundaries of the boat bubbles. Once we've extracted bounding boxes around the vote bubbles of every candidate, all we need to do to alter the votes within the image is simply swap the pixels between bounding boxes. So here are a couple examples of votes that we've swapped using this attack. We've also recorded a video demo to better illustrate our attack in action. Uh, before I show this, I just want to clarify that this demo was recorded solely for visualization purposes. The actual attack happens much faster and also has no visual components to it whatsoever. Oh. So here we have our target ballot. We first use a template match to extract the individual races within the ballot. Once we've done this, we use a Huffline transform to separate the individual candidates we now crop out the title of the race from the top candidate's window. Once we've done this, we can extract the bounding boxes around each candidate's vote bubble by using a series of linear sweeps. Once we've done this, we simply swap the pixels inside of these boxes and we've altered the votes. So I'll now be passing it off to Cart to talk further about our attack. Thank you, Jeremy. So Unclear Ballot is our uh, POC implementation of this attack, which we did in C++, and we packaged this as a window scanner driver. We also tested this on the Fujitsu FI7180 scanner, which is an EAC certified, uh, which is certified by the EAC for use in elections as part of Clear Ballot's Clear Vote system. So our malicious microdriver uh, wraps around the original driver for the Fujitsu scanner and serves as an interface between the actual scanner and the uh, election administration. So, uh, the election administration software, as shown in the image at the bottom of the slide. So to ensure the versatility of our attack, we tested it across six different ballot styles. Four of these are in use by the largest election vendors in the US. These are ESNS, Heart, Dominion, and also Clear Ballot. We also used two older styles of ballot from Heart and Diebold. So uh, you can see all, all six of those styles on the slide. So to test our attack, we prepared 720 marked contests using the Bocce systemization, 120 per each of the ballot styles shown in the slide previously. So for each of these 120, 60 of these would be what Bocce would consider filled ballots, and we would have 10 of each of the marginal marks shown at, on the bottom, and also 10 empty ones, which ends up, being, which ends up giving us 120. So one key insight behind our attack is that an attacker would not have to alter a significant fraction of the votes in order to change the results of most elections. Because it, this gives us a lot of leeway with our attack because if we're not confident that we can move a marking without, uh, without leaving trace artifacts that could be visible upon inspection, we can just skip over this ballot and move on to the next one. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see an image of a ballot that we would not attempt to alter. As you can see, that it's an overfilled ballot. And if we were to attempt to create a bounding box around this marking, it would, it would overlap with the candidate's name. So because of this, when we, if we were to attempt to swap it with another can, the vote to another candidate, we would be taking part of the candidate's name along with the ballot. And this would be very apparent upon visible ins inspection. So shown here is the performance of unclear ballot upon each of the six different uh, ballot styles that we used. So as can be seen, for each of the, for the 60 ballot marks for each of the ballot styles, we were able to move at least 50% of the marks, except for the case of heart e-scan. And across invalid and ballot marks for each of the ballot styles, we were able to move 
eight, at least 18% of ballot marks. Given if we were to launch this attack, and at this rate, we would have been able to swap the results in 48 out of 51 of the districts in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The only red districts that we could not have turned blue are Wyoming and West Virginia. Wyoming was won by Donald Trump, 68 to 22, and West Virginia was won by Trump, 68 to 26. And on the other hand, D.C. is the only blue district that we could not have been turned, as it was won by Hillary Clinton, 91 to 4. <laughs> However, it, even if we were to uh, be able to alter Wyoming's uh, results, this would not be realistic as it would not be believed by the, people, by the public. However, in a close election, it is very possible that we would be able to change the results to either one of the candidates. So along with the 720 marked ballots that we tested on, we were able to obtain a corpus of around 181,000 ballots from the November 6, 2018 general election in Clackamas County, Oregon. So these votes were of the Hart Verity style, and the votes were centrally counted with an optical scanner. Because they were centrally counted, this would have been an ideal target for our described attack, as an attacker would only have to inject a malware onto devices in one location. So shown on this slide are the results of our testing on the ballots from Clackamas County. Uh, our program rejected tw around 20,000 of these ballots, which amounts to about 11%, which when we, we uh, inspected a subset of these 20,000, and on many of these ballots, we noticed that there were scanning glitches. For example, on many of these, we noticed uh, pixelated lines that ran through the length of the ballot image, which messed up with that, which messed up our Huff line transform. We wanted to emulate the behavior of a real attacker, and a real attacker would want to ensure that they would not be leaving any trace artifacts on upon swapping. So we used pretty conservative parameters with this attack, and even with these conservative parameters, we were able to alter si around 62,000 votes, which amounts to 34% of the ballots. We sampled uh, 1,000 of these ballots randomly that had been altered, and there were no visible artifacts that uh, we could, just by looking at them, we were not able to determine any visible artifacts. The alteration time for this was 279 milliseconds per ballot, while the fastest heart scan time was 352 mark milliseconds per ballot, which puts us well below the threshold we need to be at to conduct this attack. However, it should also be noted that we did not conduct any optimization on our algorithm, and if we had done so, we'd further be able to bring down our alteration time. So are, do image audits serve any use if they can be used to uh, detect attacks? It turns out they're very good at certain things, such as catching non-adversarial error. So two examples are, of this are in Maryland in 2016, 2,000 ballots were discovered with the help of image audits. And a flaw was discovered in the ESNS DS850 high-speed scanner where ballots were sticking together and being scanned in at the same time. So if there were two, two ballots to stick together and only one of them would be counted. However, it cannot, these, these image audits cannot be relied upon in adversarial, in adversarial environments. What about image detection? Is it possible that vendors could implement detection into their systems in order to discover if alterations have occurred? It turns out that image detection ends up becoming an arms race at best, because as detection algorithms improve, so do the manipulation algorithms to counteract them. So if, <clears throat> it's very likely that an attacker would be able to get their hands on detection code if it, it were implemented into a system. And with this detection code, they would be able to improve their manipulation algorithm to defeat this. Another thing that an attacker could do to defeat a detection algorithm is they could use it as part of their mark moving algorithm. So let's say, uh, let's say our attacker has a ballot and they alter the ballot with their algorithm. They would then run that, the altered ballot through the detection algorithm. And if the detection algorithm detects that it's been altered, they would skip the ballot and just move on. But like, even so, like, regardless of any of this, to our knowledge, no election vendor in the U.S. has even minimal image detection in their systems today. So how can we protect against this? The best solution is to use risk-limiting audits where people are looking at physical ballots. This system is, like, you, 
with these risk limiting audits, you ensure that the process is fully software independent and cannot be manipulated at any point. These risk limiting audits ensure that there's a high probability of detecting errors, there's a high probability of detecting fraud, and also of error. And even if every single machine in the voting system is infected, you will still be able to find, you will still be able to determine whether there, an alteration has occurred. So what do we take away from this? These image audits can, <clears throat> and it's, so image audits involve checking digital photos of ballots rather than the actual physical ballots. However, as we have shown, an attacker can use computer vision methods to automatically alter and manipulate these images and move, change the results to their desired candidates. We implemented this with an EAC certified scanner, the Fujitsu FI7180 scanner. And this, this scanner is part of Clear Ballots, sorry, Clear Ballots Clear Vote system. And we showed that our attack works across um, all the, like ballot styles from all major vendors in the US. The best defense against this, against this is for people to audit the ballots physically. So the work that we presented today, it, we compiled into a research paper and this will be presented at eVote ID and it, the, also known as the International Joint Conference of Electronic Voting. And for the, we're releasing it to the public today on these two links. So if you go to those links right now, you can, have, you can access the full papers. So we'll now be opening up the floor to any questions. Yeah. yeah go I'll go ahead. Yeah, having, having actually hacked voting machines, one of the things that I would like to ask you is, if you took the images and compared them to the actual ballot, you'd find the attack, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. If you if you compare it to the physical ballot. The same thing that we found in the Hari attack, with a, a Hari attack, is basically it only works if you didn't examine the actual paper at all. Yeah. If you examined a portion of the ballots against the images using the clear ballot, this attack would fail, wouldn't it? This would. Yes, it would. Okay, thank you. Which is which is why you need at some point you need to go back to the physical ballots. That is correct. Yeah. Great work. Um, this is one minor technical question. Um, it seems from what you described that the bounding boxes around um, marked bubble boxes would probably be larger than the bounding boxes around the um, So, how do you swap the pixels between bounding boxes and the size? Do you want to take this one? So, there is logic in place to normalize the size between all of the bounding boxes for like an individual race. Oh, yeah. Great work. I, I, I wanted to put the concept to come up with two questions. One, um, I think while well, you have to look into the audit, it's also useful for forensic purposes to capture images, assign them at the time of capture, publish the signature, and use that as uh, an additional aid to. We have no idea if this image is right, but at least the paper ballot wasn't altered after the image was taken to be able to be helpful because the data custody is a really difficult thing to get to the So I suggest thinking that it's important as an advantage. Okay. I wonder if your code We're not going to be making it available just to, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. What was that? Yeah, that's correct. It's on the back end. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's this is it's a flexible attack. Like every like every scanner is going to have a driver to interface with the actual the actual system, and so this is we you can just adjust it to work with a different type of scanner. Yeah. So on like you guys had putting out the eight fifty or DS nine, that one does all of the optical scanning and storage way off the machine. Would you be able to do something where would you transfer that to a computer and move it into software or the audit? Do something similar? So our attack is on the drivers. So we re we create we create a malicious driver. However, you could also create you could also implement this attack at different points in the stack. You could implement it on the actual election administration system, and also you could also you could also implement this attack on the actual uh, scanner firmware. So that's a possibility. So if we were to if you were to implement it on the actual firmware, then that would be an, that would be a possible attack on what you described. Uh, yeah. We were manipulating the bitmaps that were that are returned at to the that are returned from the actual Fujitsu driver. So before they're rendered as any type of actual image, they're uh, they are we get there's a stream of bitmap data. That's yes. correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna get to him. I'll, I can get to you after. All right. um, so there's, I think, three precautions. That there's a whole group of people that are uh, really interested in validating verification, and I think there's three precautions that they're interested in in order to make that work. One is to put a unique identifying number on each ballot and ballot image, so that you would be able from the ballot image to go back to the specific paper ballot and have a unique identifying number stand on it. And one is to do a hash, which I think some of you already talked about. The whole group of values has a hash of some sort of that they use change the hash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's where we need to be very careful in trusting the algorithm about it. Would, if those precautions were in place, would that affect your ability to just hash? So you're you, you mentioned a hash. Um, for the hash to be secured, you'd have to ensure that the it, the key that's being used with the hash is also secured. That what it's being hashed with is um, also um, not publicly available, and it's possible that an attacker would be able to get that and recreate a hash for their the manipulated ballot. There are sys end to end um, end to end systems that such as Scantegrity and Predivotaire that this that this attack would fail with and it would be very hard to make this work with those type of systems. So those are some systems similar to what you said. Um, <clears throat> for example, Predivotair, the candidate order is randomized and <clears throat> when you when you cast a ballot, you rip off the actual markings from the candidate list. So you cannot tell based on the ballot. So the ballot markings are tied with a key and so you cannot tell just from looking at the ballot who someone voted for because that order is randomized and it's removed from the candidate list. Those ballots will have That's true, but with such a system you could create a public bulletin for users to uh, verify their votes. However, that you, then you run into issues of selling votes. Yeah. Okay. Not with credit vote? Okay. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Professor Bernalo no, definitely knows better. Yeah. So that you that would not be an issue actually. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
So that's correct. Um, that that case is when the tabulation occurs at a di like the tabulation occurs with different scans from the actual scans used with the image audit. However, with something like that, it would have to be, you have you would have to attack both the systems and somehow coordinate it to ensure that you're getting these same results with the attack. That would be a little bit that would be a more complicated scenario. However, um, our attack focuses on if the tabulation. If the scan for the tabulation and the image audits occurs at the same time, yeah. Any other questions? Oh uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we have time. Uh, that's correct. So I think that's uh, how the scan integrity system works, if I'm correct. So that would be more difficult. However, we could we could adapt our attack to that. So instead of actually moving the like swap completely swapping the ballot boxes, we could, for example, have a data file of marks that we could insert in insert and remove. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, no, we have not done that. That would be a good step, though. Uh, I guess I think we have one time for one more question. To attack the voting machine? It's a post exploitation tool. So we're assuming that someone has has hacked the machine, which there's like. Um, which is very possible. There's a, a lot of publications regarding that. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>